أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه. ويسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى to help us recognize the truth and help us follow it and to help us recognize the falsehood and help us avoid it. ويسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى to make the best of our deeds the last ones that we do and the best of our days the day that we shall meet. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. The topic today, what is the topic today? How to be an effective Muslim worker. Well, I think the important thing here that we'll be focusing about in the importance of the amal, at least in the beginning, the importance of action, that any true belief has to be expressed through actions. Otherwise, it's like a sterile belief. It's just like an academic belief. So it starts with the heart, but then after that, it has to find a way to express itself. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَقُلْ يَعْمَلُ فَسَيَرَ اللَّهُ عَمَالَكُمْ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَسَتُرَدُّونَ إِلَىٰ عَالِمِ الْغَيْبِ وَالشَّهَادَةِ فَيَنُبْدِرُكُمْ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ Let's say work, act. So there has to be an action. Iman is not just in the heart, but it has to be expressed through action. That's what Al-Basri said, لَيْسَ الْإِمَانُ بِالْتَمَّنِّ وَلَكَ الْمَوَاقَ لَوْفِ الْقَلْبِ وَصَدَّقَهُ الْعَمَلِ The Iman is not just a wish or an abstract feeling or something that's in the heart, but he says it's something established in the heart and expressed by action. So this amal is something really important. We're talking about an amal, the Islamic work or the Islamic uh, activism or the Islamic involvement. This doesn't have to be the same work that everybody's doing. You know, much of the time we think that to be involved, I have to do to sit by the table, Islam on the one, or preach da'wah or whatnot. No, actually, the Islamic work involves so much more than that. Anyone that has any talent, any gift, can use it in a certain way to serve this cause. So everything that leads into the establishment of this message and its spread goes under the Islamic work, the Islamic amal, the Islamic activism. It doesn't have to take a specific shape. We don't have to take a specific model or a specific person and duplicate what they're doing. Because sometimes you may have a certain gift or a certain talent that may be different from everybody else. And by going that way, you'll be able to contribute something that others actually cannot. That's why action is something really important as part of the Iman in itself. Now the question is, this is the basic question, why do we get involved? Why do we work? That was a question for you. <laughs> why do we work? Why, what are we doing here for? You know, why, why do we get involved? Why do we get involved in the Da'wah, in the Islamic work, in any kind of form of activism? Why do we do that? To share Islam. To share Islam. That's good. That's a means, probably. But the goal is bigger than that. To please Allah, and then what? To please Allah and to go to Al-Jannah. We're going to keep that in mind, Allah. Because sometimes, as basic as it is, and as obvious as it is, it got forgotten. You know, a lot of the time we forget that. We forget why we're doing this. And this becomes really important to keep in perspective whenever we plan something, whenever we do something, to keep in perspective always that my goal is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My goal is to enter Al-Jannah. That's what I'm doing all this for. And that's why this has to remain always in perspective. When you're talking about the Islamic work, by the way, the topic is really big and huge. And the deeper the involvement in the Islamic work, uh, the more uh, guidance I would need. Uh, the more involvement there is, the more things to be considered actually have to be there. That's why today, inshallah, I'll try to talk a little bit in generalities. And inshallah, we'll leave the specific to the Q&A. But certain basic things that we need to keep in mind whenever we're involved. That if the goal is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to go to al Jannah, then our involvement in the Islamic work is a form of ibadah, is a form of worship, right? And for that to lead us into the acceptance, to lead us into the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then like any ibadah, there are certain requirements that have to be kept into consideration. I cannot do things the wrong way and expect the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? You know the famous, uh, there's a uh, the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا The one who created life and death, so as to test you who does the best of deeds. They ask him, فُلَيْلَ بْنُ عَيَاتِ مَا أَحْسَنُ الْعَمَلًا What is the best of deeds? And he says, أَحْسَنُ الْعَمَلِ أَخْوَصُهُ وَأَصْبُهُ The best of the deeds is the one that is most sincere and the one that is done most right. We'll explain that further. He said the best of the deeds is the one that is done for the sake of Allah and that is then also following the footsteps of the Prophet ﷺ. So the goal and the path have to be in accordance with the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why the famous verse in, the, in Ali Abraham where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَكِنْ كُنُ رَبَّانِيِينَ 
اذا كنتم تعلمون الكتاب وما كنتم تدرسون that be rather be godly what is rabbaniyin rabbaniyin involves two components in there that i have to be godly in my goal so my goal has to be the rabb has to be allah subhanahu wa ta'ala i'm doing it to please allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the second thing that my path has to be in accordance with the teachings of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala both of these components by the way sometimes we have one and we don't have the other activism pure activism is when the person doesn't have the first component or when the person you know, just you know in other words the goal is not allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before some other activities or some guidelines but the second goal becomes the second component also is essential so both of these components the goal is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the pleasure of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the path is the guidance of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that of the prophet so when we're talking about being involved both of these components when we say that the goal is the uh, pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does that mean? What does that mean? Come on. It includes something, right? It's not just a statement. What do you think? Uh, there's no gradient, by the way. You know, what does that bring to your mind when we say that, when I can call our brain, that the goal is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What does that mean? What does that include? Any component? What? Pleasure the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. More than that. More specific. Try to dissect it. Good manners, man. What? Good mannerism. That's a good mannerism, I think that may probably go more than the, the path, the other component. But we're talking about the goal being Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Helping others? That's also probably in the, in, the, in the path. It means having the ikhlas, right? Having the sincerity, and also having the spirituality. Having that feeling, that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we're talking about what goes inside your heart in there. That I'm doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That my goal is to do something that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something important, it's an important component in any form of work, any activism. And the hadith, the famous hadith of Ibn Umar alayhi when he said, what the Prophet alayhi sallam said, that the deeds are by their intention. And the interesting thing in that same hadith, the Prophet says, whoever migrates for the sake of Allah and His Messenger, then his migration is for Allah and His Messenger. Whoever migrates for a woman that he seeks to get married to or for worldly benefit or business, then that's what his migration was for. Now here, look at the great deed. Somebody is migrating with the Prophet ﷺ, but because the intention is not proper, is not correct, then the big, huge deed doesn't count. So his migration with the Prophet ﷺ was done for something else. So there has to be this level of ikhlas. And, and here, by the way, this ikhlas sometimes, or the fear of lack of ikhlas, becomes an impediment sometimes, becomes a paralysis. That I'm so afraid, I don't have ikhlas, I don't work anymore. <laughs> I don't do what I'm supposed to do anymore. You know, even when it comes to the ibadat, by the way, I'll mean, give you an example. Well, for any deed to be accepted, it has to be done for the sake of Allah, right? So let's say at home, I don't pray nobody sunnah. When I come to the masjid, I pray sunnah, everybody's watching. So what's the conclusion? I'm doing it for the sake of the people. That's not a class, so I shouldn't be doing it. Right? No? Yes, maybe? <laughs> Something? <laughs> Is that a correct attitude? Then what's the answer to that? How do I deal with that? Well, I'm doing it because people are around me. That's the reason I'm doing it for. Start doing it at home too. What? Start doing it at home. I start doing it at home, but when I go home, I don't have enough energy, enough motivation to do it. So I come to the budget. Do I do it or do I stop doing it? Continue doing it. Make a clear knee. Continue doing it and make your intention clear. Yes. See, for anything that we do, like I said, there are two components. There's the action and there's the intention. Right? If I'm concerned about the intention, I should not penalize the action. The action should continue, and I will work on the intention meanwhile. So that's why the Sunnah still has to be prayed. That's the bottom line. It has to be prayed. Not as a fun, but as a recommendation. You know, I have to be praying this Sunnah. If I have a problem with the intention, I have to focus on the intention, not the action. So the action has to continue. I can look at it in a different way. That when I come to the mission, it encourages me to pray Sunnah. That's a good way to look at it. That's why, again, I'm talking about the other extreme. So the ikhlas has to be there. 
back to what I said earlier, that I have to be doing something for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At least the consciousness of that, the awareness of this ikhlas has to be there. When I'm doing something, I have to be doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why does that become important? Because sometimes, you know, what pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the same thing as what pleases people. You know, Allah, you know, enjoys good, you know, the commands of the Quran and the Sharia is to establish the masalih, the matters of benefit. But sometimes they fork. Which one do I choose? You know, sometimes in the process of trying to pursue a certain uh, gain or certain masla or certain political gain, it may lead me to compromise on what pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which one do I choose? If my goal is to enter a jannah and to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that always has to be in perspective. I should not forget that. I should always remind myself of that. That I'm doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So sometimes there could be situations where that becomes of secondary importance. It should, it should be. Like I said, where sometimes we measure success by how much political uh, achievements, or how much political gain we achieve. It's not bad. I'm not saying that political, achieve, political gains is bad or anything, you know, but sometimes it goes in different ways. What pleases people is not the same thing as what pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which one do I choose? In my planning, in my work, in my activism. Or another way sometimes where uh, that sincerity may not be in there, where the goal of our planning will be just to uh, collect numbers. We measure the success of any event by how many people show up. It's good. We want to reach out as many people as we can, but this is not the measure. And sometimes when that becomes our focus, then we tend to compromise on our goal from the event. We try to choose certain topics that appeal to the people, just so as to bring them in. Certain things that are emotional in nature, talking about what's happening in Syria, what's happening in Palestine, in Iraq, in Bangladesh, or somewhere else. Whatever topic it is that brings people in. And it becomes our focus. Let's choose a topic that people actually can listen to. Now, if that's the end of the story, this is not good. We may bring people in order to give them the true message. This is really good. That's a good plan. But what I'm saying is that it should be done with the purpose of doing or knowing what Allah likes and we'll do it in that regard. We'll plan it with that into perspective. And not just to bring the crowd, but to do something that benefits the people, that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, sometimes we do that, we choose topics that, probably we want you to say something that makes people cry. As if this is the goal. And it's good to connect with the people and to establish this spirituality, but this should not be the end of the story. That's what the problem, that's what I'm talking about. Or sometimes, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Say, this is my path. I call toward Allah. How do we sometimes call to something other than Allah subhanahu can you think of a scenario, of a situation? Anyone? <clears throat> what was the question? The question again. Allah says that this is my path, I call toward Allah. How do we sometimes call to something other than Allah? Examples. Call towards organizations. Call toward an organization. You know, but, but even that sometimes, I think you have to explain that a little, a little further. Uh, sometimes I may call toward an organization because I believe in the vision of that organization. I believe in the message. I believe this organization is, is a good organization that is fit to need to provide something. Here, if that's my intention, this is good. But sometimes we call for organizations just because it's my organization. It's mine. Or we call for, instead of calling for the truth, we go for an opinion. You know, in other words, instead of uh, preaching, the truth, I preach a specific version of that truth. And I preach it as if it's the truth. I'll give you an example. Halal meat versus the Biha meat. <laughs> the classical one. Which one is, is it? Now here the Sharia allows more than one opinion. And you have the choice of choosing one or the other. And both have their legitimate dalil. I'm not going to get into the fakhi aspect of it, by the way. But both have a legitimate dalil. For one, it's one. For others, it's the other. Now here I cannot preach that as if I'm preaching uh, the truth or Amr al-Ma'ruf al al-Munkar. Whenever you have multiple legitimate opinions, then here enjoying the good and forbidding the evil will not be the area of it. Will not be. This is, because I'm not forbidding an evil, 
I'm not forbidding an evil, but I'm actually presenting one of the opinions. That's what it is. So I will not present an interpretation of a certain teachings as if it is the teaching itself. See, there's a difference between the text and the interpretation of the text. The text, I'm talking about the Qur'an or the Hadith. The Qur'an is a sacred text, right? That's a sacred text. No question about that. The interpretation of that text is not sacred. Unless the text is conclusive in its meaning. So if the text supports more than one interpretation, any Quranic verse, I hope, are you following what I'm saying? If you take a Quranic verse that supports more than one meaning, and to me I take one interpretation, if somebody disagrees with my interpretation, I will not tell him you're disagreeing with the verse. No, he's disagreeing with my understanding of the verse. That's a different thing. That's why the sacred is te the text is sacred. The Quranic verse is sacred. But the interpretation may not be sacred. And I cannot preach the interpretation as if it's the text itself. Certain teachings are sacred. You know, There's no more interpretation except there's only one God. There's no inter multiple interpretations in there. You seek Allah in matters of inheritance, the daughter has or the, the, the son has twice the share of the daughter. That's it. That's one interpretation. There could not be more than one interpretation. But there are certain aspects of the Sharia that support more than one interpretation. In preaching it, I cannot preach it as if this is the Quran. That's what I'm talking about. When the Sharia itself allows more than one interpretation. So out of this ikhlas is that and the tajarrud and selflessness is that I preach the truth as a truth and not something short of the truth. Okay? Any question or comment before I move on? So again, back we said that the goal and the means have to be in accordance with Allah's teachings. Subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet was to them. So again, we're still talking about the first one. That the goal is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Included in that is what's happening in your heart. This connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which is the fuel, by the way. Allah says, وَتَزَوَّدُ فَأَنَّ خَلَزَ الْتَقْوَى That have this, the best of the provision is this taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something that is required from every Muslim. That the da'i, the Muslim worker, requires more of that. Needs that more so than the other people. Because this is something that you'd be needing whenever you face any challenge. Whenever you face any challenge, this is, you know, what's going to give you the strength and the support. To connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time. You know, if you look at the revelation, of course the revelation is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also the order of revelation has a significance. The order in which the Qur'an was revealed also has a significance. That's also a revelation. So you look, the first thing that was revealed was what? What was the first thing that was revealed? What? The first five verses of Surah Al-Allah, Ikra, Bismillah, Ikra, Nadi so there is a call here to acquire knowledge, to learn, to acquire you know, And then after that came, what's the next uh, surah? After the call, first part of the call. Oh. No. The Muddathar. The Muddathar. The Muddathar. So all you who is covered, stand up and start, you know, preaching, declaring your message. So here, immediately from the beginning, the command to do the work came from the beginning. So there was no time that I've studied for five, six, seven years, ten years, whatever, and after that, I'm getting involved. No, the involvement was from the beginning. Even though the only thing that was revealed at that time were the five verses of Surah Al-Alaq, and that's Surah Al-Muddathir, but still, the command came, come for them, stand up and start warning the people. And that was what the Prophet, that's what the Prophet alayhi salatu was telling them. So there's knowledge, and there is work, amal. What's the third Surah that was revealed? Here there are multiple opinions. The Muzzamin, some they say Al-Qalam and then Muzzamin afterward, but Muzzamin complements those, those two. And the Muzzamin also says, Qum, Ya Ayyuhal Muzzamin, Qum, Qum in Dayda Inna Qalila, Nisfaha wa Muqasminhu Qalila, Awtida Alayhi wa Raddi Al-Qur'an Atartila. That in the first, the Muddathir, the command was to start warning, start preaching, start spreading the message. The second one, Al Muzzamin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us where we get the energy and the support from. Ya ayyuhal muzzamir, qum in layla illa qalila, stand up and start praying for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For, and Allah gave him different choices, half of the night, one third, or two third of the night. 
And then after that, Allah says, "Inna sadunqi alayka qawlan thaqila." We will reveal to you a weighty message. So Allah said to the Prophet والسلام, pray at night and recite the Quran and connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's going to be a difficult message. And that's exactly what it was. It you was know, like somebody saying to you, you better have a big sahur, it's going to be a long fasting day. Something similar to that. So in other words, Allah is saying to the Prophet والسلام, it's going to be a difficult task ahead. Conveying any message, any change is difficult. There'll be resistance in there. How do you prepare for those difficulties? This connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this has to always be there. By connecting, because that gives you the fuel and the support more than anything else. When anything else fails, that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remains. So when we're talking about the goal is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's to connect to all of the above, what I mentioned earlier. So again, the goal is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also the path is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah's guidance subhanahu wa ta'ala. What am I talking about right here? The path is the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Give me some comments, something. What? What if you don't have a problem or something, specifically the situation you're dealing with? The situation you're dealing with. Let's say you don't have something that specifically says, how do you hold a campaign in Phoenix, Arizona? Your organization based on what you know, and then it's Yeah. So first, first of all, you have to look for a direct text. That's always the beginning. In other words, if you have a direct command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you cannot go with ishtihad. Go back to the verse. You know that in inheritance, the son will have twice the share of the, of, the, of the daughter. That's it. This is clear. Right? So there's no more interpretation about that. That's, that's a clear command. Sometimes you don't have a clear command. Or for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, about the khabar or maisir, rishzum min alam shaytani fashtari. That uh, wine is prohibited. Clearly prohibited. That's it. No wine. Right? I mean, there's a text in there. So I cannot look at some other interpretations. There's a clear text in there. When you don't have a text, sometimes you may have a related text. Where the Prophet or the Quran gives you some general command, general guidance, and you take that and you apply it to the situation. For example, you know, uh, weeds, smoking weeds. Is it halal or is it haram? You look at the guidance that the Prophet has laid down. You look at, you know, the other aspects, the harm for the effect and all of that, and you come to the conclusion that it is haram. So you have here an indirect Guidance. You don't have a text that clearly states way is haram. You have general guidance. But sometimes you have situations where it doesn't say anything. Here, you look at the ishtihad. You look at, you know, opinion, analysis, the other consideration and whatnot. And then you look for the answer. You don't start from there. You end in there. You don't start by looking at, you know, analysis and all of these things. You first have to start with the text. We're talking about the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why you have to look into the text. And you do not start with the maslaha. This is the last approach that you use. The last approach that you use is to go into that area when you do not have a text. But you, you do have a text, then you start with the text. And again, we're talking about halal and haram here. We're not talking about, we're talking about pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and going to al -jannah. That's why I said that has to always be in perspective. We're not like everybody else. We're not pure activists. No, we are believers. We have guidance. And that's what defines us as Muslim, by the way. What defines us is that I follow the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Prophet I don't always start everything from scratch. When I, when I don't have a text, yes, I will go back into opinion, into analysis, what is of benefit, what is not of benefit, so long as even that does not contradict with some established Islamic principles. But I did not start with that. I ended there. I started by looking at the text. And the Muslim is bound by that text. The Prophet ﷺ said something that will bind me. That will bind me. I cannot have an intellectual discussion as, what do you think, you know, Jum'ah? How about doing it on Sunday? <laughs> well, it's more of benefit now people work. What about people thought this way, by the way? You'd be amazed. You know, Jum'ah, you know, I mean, 
The purpose is to worship, is to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You get more people on Sunday, you know. So let's do it on Sunday. You know, if we don't have any piece of guidance in the Quran, maybe yes, maybe there's a narrative there. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, يَوْمَ الْجُمْعَةِ فَاسْعَوْا That's it. There's a text in there. There's a text in there. I do not go beyond that. That's why I don't always go into analyzing. Well, this is very important for the da'iyah in particular. Because sometimes we get so caught in the small and the details, we forget the bigger picture. We are according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we have to take that into, into account. We have to take that into account. Into deciding what is the thing that pleases Allah the most. That should be the guiding principle. What pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most? I want to know what pleases Allah the most, and I want to do it. If it brings a maslaha, this is good. And the, the deed brings a maslaha, but sometimes, maslaha means matter of benefit, by the way. But sometimes our assessment of maslaha may not, may not be the accurate one. Sometimes we look at maslaha, the matter of benefit, from a specific perspective that may not be the comprehensive one. We may consider the maslaha as to reach out to non-Muslims, you know, to provide some good environment for this, or matters of benefit of that. But we forget the biggest maslaha is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why we have to keep that always into perspective. Whenever we vote with the Islamic work, that my path is that which is delineated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Prophet I don't want to lose that perspective. Any, any comments? So far? Yes, no? Well, I have an example in here. Uh, there's a uh, Hassan al-Banna has put 10 qualities, by the way, of the effective Muslim worker. Anybody read those? Anybody's familiar with those? 10 qualities. Let me see my hand just show them. So he said when he was talking about the effective Muslim worker, he mentioned 10 qualities. Anybody can list them? Ikhlas. What? Ikhlas. Uh, he didn't mention Ikhlas because he mentioned it actually as a separate article. So when we talk about Akkad al bayas he mentioned Ikhlas separately. First of all, what, somebody said something. Qawiyya al-Jasim. Qawiyya al Jasim, or someone who has, who is able-bodied. So the person has to be physically capable because we're talking about Amal in here. You know? And this, by the way, is relative to the person. In other words, the person tried to be in the best shape that they could. Whatever actually uh, their situation allows. That's the first one. What's the What? Sound, mind, actually, uh, both are, sound is there and mind is there. <laughs> There's educated mind, and he said sound worship, or sound aqeed, actually. So he said, the person has to be educated, his mind has to be educated. I mean, the Muslim cannot afford to be isolated from everything else. So first, uh, able-bodied, educated mind, uh, sound worship, or correct worship, and sound belief, sound aqeed. That's four. Capable of supporting himself to be independent. You know, you know when, you, when you're independent, you can decide. You can take stands according to what you believe in. Nobody owns your stand anymore. Five. What? Organizing their affairs. Organizing their you know, preserving of their time. Organizing their affairs. That's two. I'm cheating. <laughs> you know, that they have to be organizing their affairs. You know, or preserving of their time. What else? Well mannered, good man. This is a very important one, especially for the deaf. Two more. Beneficial to others. Beneficial to others. There's one last one. That's a very important one. You can say this is a lot. This applies to everything that we do. Mujahid al nafsi, struggling against oneself. You know, not uh, enslaved by habits by weaknesses, but always struggling with oneself, always trying to achieve something. Well, the one particular quality that I'd like to talk about, how much time do I have for that? What? We're good? <laughs> when he said, well-mannered, well-mannered, and this is an important quality of an effective Muslim worker, he has to be well-mannered, having a good character, because this is the face of your message. You know, people sometimes may accept your message or reject it based on you, yourself, on your character. So that's really what conveys your message to the others. 
you have to be well mannered. You have to be well mannered. And this particularly becomes challenging for the Muslim worker. First of all, because you're dealing with so many people. And that's not always easy. You know, it's not always easy dealing with people of different personalities, different ways of doing different things. Uh, so you need a lot of patience. You need a lot of good manners in that regard. And also because you're preaching change. And whenever you preach any change, you're, I mean, you're not going to somebody who prays five times a day in the masjid and telling him about the importance of prayer. He's already doing it better than I. <laughs> but you go to somebody who's not doing something and you ask him to do it. Or, or the other way around. So you are preaching a change. That's what we are. The message is a message of change. And whenever you're preaching a change, there'll be resistance. People like to continue what they're doing. That inertia. Continue what you're doing. I started something, I'd like to continue. Nobody likes to change. So there'll be resistance in there. There will be a lot of resistance. And some people will refuse that message that you're preaching. How are you going to react in that situation? And it becomes especially important, again, another aspect of it is because we're a diverse community. You know, when you're talking about well mannered, how is that defined? I mean, again, the Prophet Ali Salat was to that the Quran defined some good manners for us. There are some specifics. Right? So the Hujurat has plenty of these things. Or a hadith of Rasul Ali Salat was to that, the way that he acted and, and whatnot. But he didn't give us everything, Ali Salat was to He gave us some general guidelines. He didn't give us the specifics all the time. So how do we deal in a certain situation? So when we're talking about being a good mannered, which manners are we talking about? The Egyptian manners? The Lebanese manners? Uh, the Islamic manners? What is Islamic manners? That's what I'm asking. Sunnah. But sometimes it doesn't specify. It does not specify. So let's say, for example, they have a certain habit, which is part of their norms and manners in, uh, in Egypt or in Pakistan or whatever country. But Islam does not say that this has to be done this way. Do we take that into consideration or not? Yeah, I mean, as long as it doesn't go against what is appropriate in the faith, so regardless of where it's coming from, what culture it's coming from, as long as it's compatible. Okay, so, so do we recognize non-Islamic cultures? Anyone says no. Okay. So, well, but following, you know, following something. Has the Prophet ﷺ recognized other cultures in his deeds? Yes. Yes. Give me an example. He wore the clothes of certain cultures. He spoke different dialects. He dealt with different tribes. Okay. The Prophet ﷺ used to dress like his own people. You know, so they did not dress differently, alayhi salatu He used to dress like his own people. That's why we do not have an Islamic dress. We have an Islamic dress code, but we don't have a specific dress. To say, for example, that this thumb follows the sunnah, that thumb does not follow the sunnah. If you have a pocket in here, it does follow the sunnah, and the pocket in here, it does not. No, no, we do not have that. The Prophet, alayhi salatu did recognize that, and the Prophet, in his famous hadith, when he said, I was sent to complete or perfect the good morals. So he did not come to re-establish everything from scratch, but to complete. Meaning some of the things were already there, and the Prophet approved of it. And also the Prophet ﷺ, like he said, he spoke in a certain dialect by switching certain letters. ﷺ was talking to others. And also the Prophets in his messages to the kings. The Prophet ﷺ, من محمد رسول الله إلى المقوقس عظيم القبط to the Mukaukas, the great mind leader of the Copts. He did not say for Muhammad Rasulullah to the leader of the Kuffar of Egypt. You know? But the Prophet addressed people the way their own people addressed them. That's why when you're talking about good manners, you have the basic teachings of Islam, but it also has to be perceived as good manners by the others. It is not enough to say that, well, my manners are good in my heart. Well, how is it perceived by the others? This is very important. That's why the Prophet ﷺ took that into account when he wrote these messages to the different kings. You know, whether the king of Kisra, you know, the Hiraq al -Azim. He says, Muhammad Rasulullah al The great mighty hero of Al-Fursh. And he called them Kisra, which is not his name. 
Kisra is his title. That's what his own people used to call it. That's why when dealing with others, you have to take that into account. Which becomes, by the way, a little challenging when we have a diverse community. You know, but certain things are obvious. Let me give you an example. Maybe in certain circles, if I sit and put my feet on the table, it would be not a big deal. I mean, in certain circles, certain things, you know, it's not a, and they don't take it as an offense. If I put my feet, you know, you know, on the table before everybody. But imagine if I do it here. <laughs> this is not good manners. I cannot say, well, but this is not an Islamic thing, even if it's not an Islamic thing, but Islam tells me to recognize what people actually are going through. So in other words, talking to the people and taking actually their own guidance into account, so long as, like you said, it does not contradict an Islamic teaching. So if the manners of the people say that you have to drink a cup of wine in the morning, whatever, no, he doesn't have any, any value in that. That's something against my, my religion. But if it is something that, that's why some of the scholars call it an urf. They say an urf is to be taken as a source of guidance, so long as it does not contradict an Islamic, established Islamic principle. So when we're talking about being good-mannered, it means it has to be perceived by the others as being good-mannered. The reason I'm saying that, because sometimes we go to you know, one extreme or the other, you know, or either preaching our own culture as if it is Islam, and you have to do it in a certain way, or sometimes rejecting certain things that it is not Islam. And the fact is, the approach should be balanced. Neither one extreme nor the other. So when we're talking about being a good man and person, it means when dealing with the others, I have to take into account how it is perceived. They have to see it as good men. And that's how the Prophet ﷺ, who called him Salat al -Amin? I mean, it wasn't the Muslims. It was the Kuffar of Quraysh, right? I mean, even, even they were fighting him, but they were believing him. Believing him. That's why, you know, uh, what's his name? Uh, Umayyah ibn Kharaf, he did not want to participate in Badr. And then Safwan, you know, came and pushed him and embarrassed him in a situation that uh, you have to do. Why did he not want to participate, actually, in the battle of Badr? Anybody knows? Because Prophet Muhammad والسلام, told him, what we need to in the battle of Badr, we will kill him. And he trusted that. You know, the same thing his brother, Ubay ibn Khalaf, which is the one person that we know was killed by the Prophet in the Battle of Uhud. Before that, before the battle, when they were in Mecca, he was grooming his horse and, you know, basically uh, sharpening his uh, weapons. And he told Muhammad that when we meet you in the battlefield, I will kill you. And the Prophet told him, no, it is I who will kill you, inshallah. And that's exactly what happened. Basically, when he was going after the Prophet, they said he was covered with, with metal. And all he has open is a place here on his neck. And the Prophet ﷺ grabbed a spear and he shook it strongly and he threw it on him. And it hit him right in there. But it wasn't a fatal wound or anything. And the man kept on running around screaming, Qatarani Muhammad, Qatarani Muhammad. Muhammad killed me, Muhammad killed me. They told him, well, I mean, it's not really a big deal, you know. And he said, if, it's, if he spat on me, he would kill me. And true enough, in a few days he died. He believed Prophet Muhammad And that's why the manners of the Prophet were praised by his enemies before his, his own followers. That's why this is something very important when you're talking about the doubt. And you do not compromise on that. You do not compromise on that. And essential guidance, an essential thing for the Muslim worker is to have is to have this good manners. Any comments? Question? Good? Yes. I have a question. Uh, when you're dealing with non Muslims and you want to, you know, preach what's being said and it could be offensive to them, like sometimes it's like hard to you know like to just to say that the Bible is not an authentic, um, yes. you know, it's not the authentic book, so we don't believe everything that's in it in today's Bible. No, well, I think uh, that's a good question. That's a really good question. I think they would appreciate it if we tell them actually the honest truth that we believe in. But you can say it in a way that is not offensive. You know, and people ask me that question. You can say you can say that. You know, you know, offense is what we believe in. Of course, you don't, they don't have to agree with it that we believe that 
the original Bible was not written. And this is a fact, by the way, even in their own religion. It was not written during the time of Isa And the language itself is extinct now. So whenever you translate back and forth, you don't have to get into that much detail, you know. But whenever you translate something from one language to the other, you're going to add meaning, and you're going to take away meanings. No word translate exactly the same, the same way. That's why even if we assume the best of intentions, then the Bible has changed just by virtue of being translated from one language to the other, to another, to another. That's why you have multiple versions of the Bible. But we can tell them, we can tell them that we believe that the existing Bible is not the original one. It may have some remaining passages, but we don't believe that it's the original one. So when we say we believe in the Bible, we believe in the original one that was received by Isa And like I said, I think first of all, it's out of, you know, out of, uh, how shall I say, honesty, to tell them actually what the true message of Islam is. Maybe one day they will, uh, you know, it will take, you know, and then they will, uh, but to say it in an offensive way. But they have to realize, they have to realize that there are differences. I mean, we're not the same. We're not the same. There are a lot of commonalities, but there are differences as well. The concept of salvation, that's the main thing. The divinity of Isa, is, uh, we have to tell them what we believe in. Trying as much as possible, like I said, not to be offensive. But we have to tell them the truth. A big uh, issue, like when we go back to the cultures being accepted, um, we live in America and a lot of things that happen in the United States, like for example, a couple of days ago was Halloween. Um, how can we deal with that with our kids and all of the other kids that are doing it? The, you know, our Islam doesn't say directly it's haram. Some people are saying don't do it. Some people are saying do it. So how do you basically... Well, like, first of all, some people are saying it's not haram. I would say it depends on who's saying it. You know, I would say in matters like that, I would go, I would go to the imam, somebody who has the Islamic knowledge. I mean, I would not ask, look at the opinion paper that was written somewhere. He's saying that it's okay. I would do it. Well, yes, but I don't want an opinion. I want to know halal and haram. That's what I want to know. That's why when it comes to halal and haram, you refer, first I go ahead and dikri kutub la ta'ala. I ask the person who has that knowledge, that's, that's one thing. And whatever they tell me, that's what I would go by. Now, the, the issue actually of the kids, and they're like, okay, it's fun and all of that. Well, I see, that's how you build the personality, by the way. That's how you build the character. From an early age, you know, there's a beautiful story at the time of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, with al Hassan ibn Ali, his grandson. He was a very young child at that time. And he was reaching out to get some dates from the dates of a salah of the charity. And of course the Prophet doesn't eat from charity. And the Prophet told him, kikh, kikh, which is an expression he said to a very young child. So in other words, he was very young, Hassan. Kikh, he says like, leave it, don't eat from that. And he told him, don't you know that we Ahlul Bayt don't eat anything from charity? At that early age, that's how you build it, that's how you start it. To say that we have our eat, we have our eat, they have their own thing that they celebrate. So we don't have to follow what everybody's doing. We are different from everybody else. We are different. We have our own guidelines. We have our own set of preachings and teachings, and we follow that. And it starts at an early age. It starts at an early age. Even if it brings a temporary enjoyment and whatnot, yeah, but we're looking at the bigger picture here. As a murabbi yourself for your kids, you have to think ahead. It's not just one particular instance, but that's how you build a strong character. And the Prophet did say, alayhi salatu was you know, لَا يَكُنْ أَحَدُكُمْ إِمَّا Do not be a yes person. You follow what everybody's doing. No, you have your own principles and your own guidelines that you follow. But in matters like that, I would refer to somebody who has Islamic knowledge. Not, again, not somebody who knows how to articulate a certain opinion. We're talking about halal and haram. We're talking about halal and haram. That's why I would ask someone who has that knowledge. So you think it is that serious, halal or haram, actually, uh, that issue like that? I think any issue, you know, look at the bigger, and I, by the way, personally, I believe it's haram. You know, I believe, my, I believe haram, and I have many reasons for, for, for saying that. But I'm talking about the bigger picture in general, that when I'm looking at that situation or any other situation, halal or haram, what I said earlier, I don't look at the maslaha first. I look first at the text at uh, whether there's an answer or related to it. Actually, in the text, if there is, then that finds me. 
But for that, I would ask somebody who has the Islamic knowledge. Again, I would not refer to somebody who is a good speaker. Good speaker is something, and is something else. Not every good speaker is a good, knowledgeable person. Subhanahu Prophet he said, that some of the expressions can bewitch you. In other words, can really you can buy into it. Just one presented argument. That's why I said you always go back to the peace. My goal is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you let that be your guide. Yes, no, maybe. <laughs> SubhanAllah, it's just a recent issue. You know, just <laughs> the discussion. You know, the funny thing is the discussion just heats up and to follow the other thing dies down. Yeah, we just follow uh, the uh, fashion, so to speak, the bulk. Whatever everybody's discussing, we discuss. And it always comes out, by the way. So who can summarize to me some of the things that we said about the Islamic, the effective Islamic worker? Yes? You have to be sincere. You have to be sincere. We said, yes. First, the importance of work. And we said that if our goal is to go to our Jannah through this work, we ask Allah to give it to all of us, then I have to look at it as a ibadah. It has to have some components of halal and haram. That becomes an important consideration. It's not just, you know, a matter of planning something for a certain purpose, period without any other consideration. I have to always keep that into perspective. That that which pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I said, for that there are two components. The verse that I quoted from Ali Imran. Anybody remembers the verse? What was the verse that I quoted? Don't think much about it, come on. Walakin, kuru, rabbani, rather be godly. And it's probably interesting to think the verse the way it says, Walakin Kudra, it's like rather be, rather be God. Walakin Kudra Rabbani. It says for a person to be Rabbani or Godly, if you were to translate it as such, it has two components. Rabbaniyat al Ghaya wa Rabbaniyat al Masdah. The person has to be Rabbani in his goal and Rabbani in his source of guidance. So in his goal, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Source of guidance meaning the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet. Anything else we discussed? When we talk about the uh, ikhlas. Yes, 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 absolutely. So the work continues. Even if I have a fear of, even if I have indicators that the ikhlas is not there, but I still have to continue. I have to continue the work. I don't penalize the action. You know, especially, by the way, if I'm involved in the jama'a work. Then here the ikhlas takes a secondary importance. I'm not saying that we disregard it. We remind ourselves and work on the intention. But sometimes if I'm involved in an Islamic collective Islamic work, I'm a jama'i, and I'm giving instructions to do something specific. That's what that, that's what I have to focus on. You know, when I commit it to this particular jama'a, that's where my ikhlas is. My ikhlas is there. But then afterward, whatever I'm questioning and requested actually to do, I have to do it. I have to listen and I have to obey. You know, when we're talking about organizing a certain event in anything, I have to fulfill that. And I have to take it seriously, by the way. And this is in the matter before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, sometimes we think that, well, it's, I'm volunteering, so it's optional. No, that's not correct. It was optional before I take it on. But once I accept to do the work, it's not optional anymore. Well, this is very important. It's optional. You know, I have the option. I presented that. Would you like to help with this? Now here you have the option to do it or not to do it. But if you decide to do it, if you accept to do it, it's not option anymore. It is something that's binding you. I have to do it. That's it. That's why the Islamic work has to be taken with this much seriousness. You know, we, we divide a certain task in the MSA or in the masjid or mass or anything else. You're supposed to do something. That's it. You have to do it to the best of your ability. It becomes something you'll be questioned about. This is an end in your, in your neck before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you accepted to do it, you didn't have to do it in the beginning. But you accepted to do it, people are counting on you to do it. And the rest of the work may depend actually on that part of yours for you to do it. And you have to fulfill it. 
واوفي بالعهد ان العهد كان مسؤولا. That's where you get the support. So all these three components, you have علم, you have عمل, and you have spirituality, connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, iman. So it starts for the علم, with acquiring certain knowledge. You know, by here, but we're not, we're not talking about becoming scholars, but whatever knowledge you need for your work, whatever work actually you're involved in. And after that work, it starts from the beginning. And after that getting the support and the connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you think, uh, I, uh, one of the things that I said, yeah. Any work we are doing right now, we are fulfilling that ayah. Yes, you see, ibadah, the verse, I did not create the jinns and the human except to worship me. Now, that ibadah, you know, of course you have the rituals. The ibadah, the uh, ibadah al you know, the rituals that have to be fulfilled, the obligations and whatnot. But anything that we do can go under ibadah, can go under worship. So it doesn't have to be. That's why. When we're talking about for the sake of Allah, the concept is much bigger than sometimes we define it to be. You know, once the Prophet ﷺ was with his companions, and they saw this man building things, moving things here and there. They said, Ya Rasulullah, You know, we wish this was for the sake of Allah. And the Prophet told them, What do you consider this for the sake of Allah among you? And he said, if he's supporting elderly parents, that is for the sake of Allah. If he's protecting a wife and supporting children, that is for the sake of Allah. That's why the concept is much bigger than sometimes we define it to be. All of that can be for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, and what I mean that pleasing Allah, it goes within the yes, understanding. Yes. Of yes, 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 absolutely. Zarqam al-Khair, absolutely. That's, what has, that's the goal. That's the goal. I'm not going anywhere. No. You're stuck with me. <laughs> That's it. that they were a thirsty dog. And the, so the, so the Prophet والسلام, her sins were forgiven. Did it mention anything about the intention? Did she have the intention that, you know, I'm going to do it for the sake of Allah? Or she just was moved by that thirsty dog and felt the confession. She gave the water to that dog. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave her his forgiveness because of that. Right? So what about the intention there? What's the intention there? Sometimes, and this is the same thing can be said about the hadith that I mentioned earlier. Sometimes the good deeds have to be done. You know, the good deeds have to be done, regardless. If you can perfect it by purifying the intention, that's great. But meanwhile, the good deeds still have to be done. And they still count before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, the beautiful verse, in, the whole Quran is beautiful, in, in Surah Al-Hujurat, where the people came to, the, the Bedouins came to the Prophet, you know, قَالَتِ الْعَرَبُ عَمَنَّا And we have Iman, Ya Rasulullah, and Allah says, قُلْ لَمْ تُؤْمِنُوا وَلَكِنْ قُلُوا أَسْلَمْنَا وَلَمَّا يَدْهُلِ الْإِيمَانُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ Don't say you have Iman, you have Islam, just mechanical, it didn't get into your heart yet. But yet, and this gives us all the great news, وَإِن تُطِيعُ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ لَا يَلِدْكُمْ مِنْ أَعْمَالِكُمْ شَيْئًا if you obey Allah and His Messenger, He will not waste any of your good deeds. So which means even if my heart state is not in the perfect situation, my deeds still count. Isn't that beautiful? Because sometimes we're not actually at that level. What we're talking about is the perfection. See, the intention is not 
a perfect or zero. It is, it is good to be perfect, or at least close to perfect. But even if it's short of that, even if a person is still doing something good, it is still something that comes before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you're driving and you see that homeless on the corner of the street, you don't have to really focus. My intention is good. Okay, now I'm good again. Just give it. Go ahead and do it. Don't think too much. Let it be your nature. This is good. This is good. So the good deeds still have to be done. Still have to be done. But the intention becomes more important sometimes when you get deep into the Islamic work. Not in the partial aspects. The leadership, you know, the conflicts, the problem. Here the intention plays an important role, a very important role. Because that's really what guides you in what you're doing. Some people, or sometimes a negative intention, by the way. The intention can be negative. Where people sometimes seek prominence, leadership, and you'll find them dying to be in charge of something. So this becomes really bad. This is definitely bad. Some people just work, they don't think about that, that's good. But some people actually have that in their mind. I want to be in charge. Unless I'm in charge, it doesn't work. It's not going to succeed. So this is bad. You have to question that. The person has to question their intention in that situation. That's why there are certain guides, certain actually pieces, some indicators that some of the scholars have put together, like uh, uh, Sheikh Karlawi in his book on sincerity, and Mahmoud Abdel Halim also has put some, some, some guides as to what tells you whether you have sincerity or not. How do I know? Anybody knows any of these comments? Anybody read the book on sincerity by Paul It's a really nice, small, concise book. What are some of the indicators? How do I know whether I have a class or not? How do I know whether actually my sincerity, my intention is even negative or not? How, I, how do I determine that? That's one of, one of the indicators that says that the person does what pleases Allah and not what pleases people. You know, sometimes it's the same, but sometimes it goes a different direction. Which one do I choose? You know, do I choose what pleases Allah or what pleases people? That's one indicator. Another one is that the person who has this ikhlas prefers to be in the less visible jobs, so to speak. You know, we need somebody to, uh, we have an interfaith uh, gathering, an open house, we need a moderator. We need somebody that speaks and welcomes everybody. And we need somebody that prepares a table before everybody comes in. Which one would you choose if you have the option? I mean, everybody will see the one who's speaking on behalf of the community. But nobody sees the one who set up the tables and the cookies and whatnot. Which one would you choose? The person who has a class would choose actually the tables and the cookies. Unless, unless they're needed there. Unless we need you actually to be the one who's speaking on the other measure. Here you have to step forward. Like Yusuf said. Sometimes you have to step forward. So that's two. Any other indicator? When you're worried whether you're concerned. Yes, being concerned about the deeds. You know whether the deeds are accepted or not. That's why here the Prophet والسلام, when Aisha was reading the verse That those that do what they do and there's fear in their heart. She said, Ya Rasulullah, is this talking about people that do sins and this fear in their heart that it might be, you know, punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And the Prophet said, no, these are people that do good deeds and this fear in their heart that it may not be accepted. So there has to be that feeling to so take it to the extreme again, where it becomes paralyzing. Another indicator. Yes. The fact that the path is long is not discouraging. The da'wah work is not a uh, drive-through work. I just do it today, and I see the results in the afternoon. Sometimes you have to plan for years. You know, so the fact that the path is long and full of obstacles, it shouldn't stop you. It should not stop you. Another indicator. Seeking guidance. Uh, well, I think seeking guidance to deal with that. But we're talking about indicators here. Another indicator is that the person who has a class would be happy if anyone does something for the benefit of Islam, regardless of who it is. So we don't monopolize it. Unless it's my masjid, it doesn't count. Unless it's my group, it doesn't count. No, no. 
If anyone, even if a non-Muslim does something that benefits Islam, it makes us happy. It makes us happy. Because at the end, it's going in the same goal, in the same sink at the end. So it makes us happy. There's a beautiful story about Ahmed and Muhammad. This is the Tajarrud. Wallah, it's so beautiful. You know, Ahmed Muhammad alayhi wa was one of the greatest heroes in Islam, in the Islamic history. And the scholars, they said that two people saved Islam after the Prophet. Saved Islam and the Muslims. The first one was Abu Bakr Siddiq when he waged the wars of Al-Ridda. The second person was Ahmed Muhammad when he took a stand regarding the creation of the Quran. There was a deviant group that were preaching that the Quran was created and was not the words of Allah. And he stood against that. Why was that important, by the way? Because when you say created, it means it's not perfect. It's not perfect. When you say created, like us. But when you say the words of Allah, it means they're absolute, they're perfect. So he was preaching that, and because of that, he was imprisoned and he was tortured for many years. One of the people that imprisoned him, that was torturing him in the prison, was a Mu'tasim, the Khalifa Mu'tasim. He was torturing him. But in that period, a Muslim woman was captured by the Romans. And she made the famous scream, Wa Mu'tasimah. Oh, Mu'tasim, come to my help. So here, Mu'tasim sent a message from Mu'tasim, Amir al-Mu'mineen, to the dog of the Romans. If you do not release that woman, I'll send you an army, the beginning of which is at your land, the end of which is at mine. And the man was scared, and he released that woman. Long story short. Now, Ahmed Muhammad, he heard of that, of what was happening. And he said, Allah is my witness. I have forgiven everything he did to me. Even though he was still in prison, he was still being tortured. He said, Allah is my witness. Everything is forgiven. I don't want anything of him anymore. That's it. Because he did something that benefits the Muslims. The person who has the khlas, this is the ultimate khlas there. The person who has the khlas will be happy if anyone does anything to the benefit of Islam, whether he's the one that did it or others. But sometimes, unfortunately, if others are doing something, we keep on putting it down and criticizing it. Well, yeah, but it had this thing, and this could have been organized better, you know. It is good to give a, you know, a constructive advice, but not to criticize all the time. Sometimes it becomes a sickness for God. What we criticize, everybody, the Muslims are not good enough. Who are the Muslims? That's you and me, right? We're not talking about somebody coming from a different planet. You know, we keep on putting everybody down. Oh, the Muslims are backward. The Muslims are not organized. The Muslims are not good man. And we keep on bashing ourselves. We're not good enough. You know, we should learn so much. This is not good. That's not good. You know, the Prophet ﷺ said, Man qala He says, anyone that says people are lost, he's the most lost among them. Another version of the hadith, Man qala halaka Anyone that says people are lost, he's the one that caused for them to be lost. This excessive criticism, you always put everybody down. A person that has a class will be happy. Anything good that is done for the benefit of Islam will make me happy. That's the way it should be. Okay. I found out I don't have a class. How do I deal with it? Okay, I just found out that yeah, I don't have it, you know. <laughs> How do we deal with that? How do we get it? Right? How do we get that class? Work and leave. What? Continue working and... How do I work on my That's my question specifically. What do I do for my niya to purify it? Yes? Being close to Allah. Being close to Allah. That's good. Any more specific if you can. You said, that's the way to get closer? Exactly. You know, these ibadat these acts of worship that are more secretive. This is something that nurtures this ikhlas of the heart. Because you're there by yourself. You don't have to do it before everybody. You do it by yourself. This is good. You know, Ibn al-Qayyim said uh, something really beautiful. He said that people's ikhlas gets eroded when they get so impressed by what they did. And they give so much credit to themselves. That's what happens sometimes. He says two things to keep in mind that would help in this ikhlas is ask yourself, who deserves the credit for what I did? Who deserves the credit, ultimately? Alhamdulillah, I was able to organize an important event. You know, uh, it was successful, you know. Uh, but how did I organize that event? Who gave me the mind to plan that? Who gave me the knowledge to guide people? Who gave me the strength 
to hold such an event. It all comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So who deserves the credit? It comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because there are certain people that don't have what I do. And they couldn't do what I did. That's why we always remind ourselves as to who the credit belongs to. That it is Allah that helped me actually do what I'm doing. The second thing to always keep in mind that as great as what we do might be, Allah always deserves better. Allah always deserves better. You don't think about the greatness of the action, but the greatness of the one you're doing it to. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why after you pray, you say what? Astaghfirullah. I was praying, I wasn't dancing or singing or anything, you know. And astaghfirullah for what? Because it wasn't done as perfectly as it's supposed to be. That's why it's sort of the Masr. When the conquest and people join the fold of Islam in large number. What do you do? Let's hold a parade, a carnival or something. As the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because maybe it wasn't done as it's supposed to be. Because Allah always deserves better. So always keep that in mind. That Allah always deserves better. And to Him belongs all the credit for anything that we do. Something, one thing that's really important here in the whole process is the collective Islamic work. That's one of the uh, tools to deal with that, with that concern there. If you're involved in a jama'ah, then sometimes that ikhlas gets tested. You know, when you're by yourself, sometimes you, you don't see the picture clearly. But when you're around others that provide you with that feedback regularly, continuously, or, you know, with other things that test your patient and test your ikhlas sometimes, that, well, when things don't go my way, would I still fight for it? Would I still actually do it? That's a test of my ikhlas in there. That's why ikhlas is best achieved, best achieved in the jama'ah. And you'll find that, by the way, true about anything in, Islamic, in the Islamic teachings. You'll find the individual, when it is mentioned in the Quran, the singular, the singular is mentioned in a negative way. إِنَّ الْإِنسَانُ لِرَبِّهِ لَكَنُوتِ قُتِلَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا أَكْفَرَ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانُ لَفِي خُسْرِ the negative is mentioned in the singular, and then the safety is mentioned in the plural. In the insana la fi khus, the singular. In the ladhi, amen. Not in the ladhi, amen. Grammatically, you can say it both ways, by the way. You know, except those. It means safety is achieved by the group. And you don't find the command in the Quran, ya ayyuha ladhi, amen. Unless it's something addressing in the singular, unless something addressing the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, specifically. But in general, the command is always mentioned in the, in the plural. Ya ayyuha ladhi, amen. كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمْ السِّيَرَةِ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تُقَدِّمُوا بَيْنَ يَدَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِذَا لَقِيلَ لَكُمْ تَفَسَّحُوا فِي الْمَجَالِسِ فَافْسَحُوا يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِنْ جَاءَكُمْ فَاسِقٌ بِلَا بَيْنَ فَتَبَيَّنُوا All of us in the plural. The singular uh, is, is mentioned in the negative way. That verse completes that, that whole picture. That so long as, it means they don't have the guidance. It doesn't mean that they're doing something good. But because the verse, the other verse says that, uh, that so long as you obey Allah and His Messenger, Allah does not waste your deeds. So this is it. That deals with it. The person tries his best. You know, I, I try my best to do what, what pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I, I move on. I don't get stuck in there. It is good to have that fear, by the way. But not to exaggerate it. To the point where it becomes paralyzing. I'm so afraid. Not what I did. Sometimes it is good to give yourself a little bit of credit, by the way. It is good to give yourself a credit because it gives you the encouragement. 
that I am making a difference. This is not showing off, by the way. It, it's not showing off, you know. But sometimes I want to feel that what I'm doing matters. I'm doing something of benefit. It is good. It is good. And, and by the way, you can see, find that even in the Prophet's guidance, when a man told him, Ya Rasulullah, you know, sometimes people praise us after we do something, after we do something, and we feel good about it. And the, is this something that conflicts with the ikhlas, basically? And the Prophet told him, you know, this is a good, like a reward in advance, so to speak. Sometimes it is good to hear a word like that because it encourages to feel that I'm doing something good, you know, I'm reaching somebody. The, the first that she no. No. Yeah, so there's no guidance. The guidance is not there. Right? No. That's what you're saying. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Okay. You heard that? So basically, we're talking about kafara uh, who are thinking they're feeding the hungry and, and doing that kind of stuff. Is that. It, it Where doesn't it mean that they're doing, you know, sometimes when they find that Allah Sa'yum, you know, uh, that they're doing something good. No, they're not doing something good, maybe to start with. Because again, the other verse that I wrote, that I quoted in Surah Al-Hujurat, you know, وَأَنْ تُطِعُوا اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ لَا يَلِتْكُمْ مَنْ أَعْمَالِكُمْ شَيْءٍ So long as you're doing something in accordance with the teachings of Allah and His Messenger, then Allah will not waste your deeds. <laughs> so my effort will be to know what that guidance is. And follow it as to the best of my ability. That's what I'm supposed to do. Well, one of the uh, things that the brothers actually suggested is to talk about some of the obstacles and the impediments that face specifically the, uh, the Muslim worker, uh, in particular. And there are quite a few of those, I think. Uh, if anybody has anything in mind, otherwise I only have something else to talk about. Well, one of the, uh, one of the things that actually, uh, one of the main things that affect poverty anyone who's involved with Islamic work is the, uh, the burnout. Uh, burning out basically, um, what we call it futur in Arabic. Futur refers to normally something that is tepid. It's not, not too hot, not too cold, but in between. Which means after somebody going basically full force, then they slow down and sometimes basically it leads them to completely leaving uh, whatever they were doing. And uh, it happens, it's very common, it's very frequent. It happens to us, by the way, a lot of the time. Why would that happen? Why would, why would that burnout happen? Has anyone experienced it, by the way? When you did not achieve your goal. Sometimes, sometimes it happens, you know, by the way, when you set a goal that you couldn't achieve it, it does discourage you. It does discourage you, basically, and then you feel burnout. And I think probably part of that is that sometimes, I'm not saying in all the situations, that sometimes some of the goals that we set for ourselves may not be actually realistic or may not be something that is achievable. So we may, set, we may set a goal that is a little too ambitious. It is good to be ambitious, but we have to be realistic at the same time. Or we set a goal that is you know, almost impossible, and of course we're faced with the reality that we did not achieve it, and, and it's not even possible to achieve, and we feel this discouragement. Uh, and I think what controls that, what takes care of that, probably is, again, I will go back to being involved with the Jama'ah. Uh, versus doing it by yourself. Because sometimes our own perspective may not be accurate. And we may not see things accurately and assess them in the proper way. And as such, we may uh, set some impossible goals in the process. But when, when you are actually with somebody else, then you're sharing experiences, you're sharing knowledge, this is less likely to happen. It is less likely to happen. But, but burning out also has some other reasons. And you find it, by the way, sometimes even in our ibadat. It may reflect itself even in the uh, in our worship, where we don't feel much motivated to pray. We don't feel much like coming to the masjid or doing certain things or being involved. And we get absorbed by so many things. And Subhanallah, life has so many preoccupations and so many things that can pull you in so many different directions. If you give in to one of them, you can easily be absorbed by one. And and that's what happens sometimes. That's really what happens sometimes. Sometimes it's uh, starting with something that. It happens. Let's say, for example, somebody will say, well, I'm going to invest my time in establishing good financial independence. And that's good. That's really great. It's great to have that. But what happens in the process, once you start seeing the money coming in, uh, it may affect you and you start asking for more. Until eventually it becomes your uh, preoccupation, basically. The thing that possesses you the most. 
even though it may start with a good intention, it may start with a good uh, reason, but eventually it owns you. And that's what a lot of the time happens, is that too much of the halal sometimes can, can be detrimental. Not too much of the haram, that's a given there. But getting too much into some of the halal things, eventually a person may become possessed by these things. That eventually it absorbs him away and takes over. What are some of the reasons, other reasons? So we said maybe unrealistic goals. What are some of the other reasons why a person burn out? The person is not being, you know, basically not, not, and you can say, by the way, not just not being refueled spiritually, but also when the person develops in, in one, in a lopsided direction, so to speak. Where, you know, as a human being, you have, there are different facets to you. There's the intellectual, there's the spiritual, there's the physical, there's everything else. And I think to be able to go on, you have to go in a balanced way. And sometimes we don't. You know, sometimes, you know, uh, we feel guilty if we have a little bit of fun, for example. And that fun is needed sometimes. You know, a legitimate fun, of course, I'm talking. I'm not talking about doing something haram, but I'm talking about something that is legitimate. Doing something, you know, taking time to go on a hiking trip, on a fun trip, watching a good movie, you know, uh, having a good hobby, you know, doing something that helps you reestablish that balance. This is important, by the way. It's not something that's on the side. It is important. To keep that, that balance. You know, sometimes, unfortunately, we feel that a Muslim has to be so serious, everything has to be serious, that we want to become boring individuals. That's someone that too shallow, too dimensional, there's no depth in there. You need some of that to reestablish your balance. Otherwise, you cannot go on. You know, if somebody goes on too strict on themselves, eventually they burn out. Because nobody can maintain that strictness. You know the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, the hadith hadith Hamdala, the Rabia, when uh, uh, he said he went to Abu Bakr Siddiq, Nafaka Hamdala, I'm a hypocrite, the Abu Bakr. Why? He says when we go to the Prophet ﷺ, we sit with him, we feel so motivated, so strong, and so, you know, like we are in agenda. We go back and we play with our families. So we don't maintain that same state of heart. And Abu Bakr Siddiq told him, I have the same feeling. So he went to the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet told him, if you were to remain the way you are when you're with me, the angels will shake hands with you in the streets. And this may indicate that you won't be human anymore. In other words, this is not human nature. And the Prophet told them, when I can say atul wasa, an hour for one and an hour for the other, for the balance. But of course, uh, you know, sometimes we go in the other extreme. <laughs> so this was said to somebody who was too concerned about his spirituality. But the point here is that the balance is the key. Whether a person is going one way or the other, you have to establish that balance to maintain or to be able to go back and to go on for a longer time. That's, that's sometimes what happens. That's one of the reasons why we burn out. What, what are some of the other reasons we burn out? Yes? The work is not being appreciated. Yeah, you can, you can say that sometimes, you know, or you don't see a result, you know. That's why I said earlier, it is good to. Uh, to be recognized uh, that I'm doing something that is of benefit. And that itself gives you the encouragement to go on further, to feel that I'm making a difference. I'm not just <coughs> working, uh, you know, without seeing anything. Yeah, of course the reward comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it's in our nature to see something tangible. We like to see something tangible. As, as an indicator, by the way, not being as the main uh, thing we're seeking. Well, what I've noticed uh, is a lot of resistance. When people face a lot of resistance, they pretty much quit. They quit doing the good deeds. Yeah, yeah. Instead of pushing forward, they, they just kind of yeah. stop doing the yeah, good absolutely. deeds. Absolutely. You know, you know, that's what being around other people that help you in that, support you in that regard. You don't feel that you're alone in that regard. You know, when do things become so big and unsurmountable? You know, when you feel that this is the biggest burden anyone has ever carried. You know, I'm working by myself. But when you run other brothers and sisters, I mean, you look at them and they're doing even more work than you are. This would help me go on. But then, you know, well, it's not that big. You look, they're doing more than I am. And they're not complaining or anything. This would give you an encouragement that others are doing the same thing. I'm not the only one that is doing it. 
That's why, again, being with a group is something that is tremendously beneficial. Uh, but like I said, you know, one of what you mentioned sometimes, you know, the, uh, the goals actually is, is really important. It is good to have a goal that we're working toward, to know what the goal is. You know, what are we doing this for? I think this is really important, especially if you're involved with any uh, leadership of any Islamic work, is to make sure that the people that are, are working with you, they know actually what they're getting into. Why are we doing this for? It's not just activities for the sake of activity. No, we have a goal, we have a plan. We have an agenda. We know actually what we're trying to achieve. This would give them the motivation and the encouragement to go on further and further, instead of just working without any other reason. But I think, again, this is probably especially important for the leadership to make sure that uh, you achieve the balance. You know, sometimes you get so caught up in the Islamic work, you forget what we mentioned earlier in the process. Your heart stops. You know, you need that boost to replenish that source of energy, to reestablish that, to go on further. We need that. We all need that. What else? If I may add what I've noticed um, from previous leaders, uh, a lot of times they quit when they are not able to see the change happening right away. They're like, I must not be doing my job, so I must not be pleasing Allah the correct way, so I'll quit and let allow somebody else to take my position. Um, so I don't know. Well, this is not good. I, I think, you know, see, it doesn't have to, I don't have to be in the leadership to contribute something. You know, you can contribute a lot without being in the leadership. So in other words, if I find someone who's more qualified, yeah, I can step down, you know, and have him do the work. But it doesn't mean either I'm in the leadership or I don't, don't do anything at all. No, I can sit, help, and support, and contribute tremendously without being in the leadership. Without being in the leadership, I can still make a big difference. Yeah. And I think it's really important for us to realize that each person can contribute something. And nobody's just another member. Each person has something that can make a difference. You know, nobody is, you know, Allah did not leave anybody uh, without any talent or any ability. Nobody is left out. Everyone has a certain gift through which he can contribute toward. That's why I said earlier, contribution or, or work, it doesn't mean duplicating what others are, are doing. You can bring in something that others actually don't have. It's good. You won't know that until you get involved, though, by the way. Yes? I think, uh... One of the problems we have here, actually, here with Zion, is the parents. The one for me is the parents. They let you equate you with the parents. You know, when it comes to you know, Arabic, Quran, yeah, they will be there on time. Outside there, any fun activities you do for the kids, they don't take it seriously, and they burn you out. Well, like the parents, I think, you know, I think if you sell them the idea properly, you know, parents, they want, the, the bottom line is that they want what is best for their kids. I mean, that's a given. And sometimes maybe we, we, don't, we don't market it well enough for them to see that they're doing that, that there's something that would, they would benefit from. That's why I think if we can market it properly, to, because they're part of the reality. I mean, it's not going to change. So they're not going to disappear. They're not going anywhere, the parents. They're there. And of course, nobody cares about the kids more than these parents. I mean, they care about these kids more than we ever will, you know. But sometimes they may not see things in the proper way, and I think it becomes our job, like I said, to market it properly to them, and to show them that what we're doing is something to the benefit of the kids. Uh, there'll always be obstacles, you know, from the parents, from the kids themselves. We just have to work around them. Sharing experiences with one another, and uh, supporting one another. And that's why I said the doubt work is, is not something to be summarized in one lecture. You know, those of you involved with Mass, you know that we have annual therapy annual meetings, central annual meeting, and now we have triple N meetings that we need every year, every year, to share experiences, to learn about these things. How do we deal with the with the with these issues? How do we make sure that the therapy remains actually in perspective? It's a continuous process of sharing experiences. Uh, nobody will get it right the first time because none of us receives revelation. That's why we have to work on that, and then we make sure that everybody's working toward the same goal. That's how we keep on meeting. Tam, Cam, Alakazam, and all of the other things. You know, we have all these things which are needed. That's why the Terbiya process, or the Dawa process, is not just giving. You have to receive yourself. You have to receive. You have to be able to receive to re-establish. You know, فَقُدُ الشَّيْءْ If I don't have something, I cannot pass on to the others. If I'm not motivated myself, I will not pass it on to the others. 
That's why the and again in mass we always have this usra system, the halaqa system where everybody has to be in an usra. Everybody has to be in this halaqa. Nobody is an exception. Because that's how you receive, that's how you recharge that banner. Because you give, you give, and there are so many challenges, you can easily give in and burn out. You have to have a certain setting, a platform, a setting, a system that helps me reconnect, that encourages me, that you know, uh, rearranges my mind, my heart, and help me do all of these things. You have to do that. That's why, again, if you're involved in any kind of Islamic work, you have to think about yourself as well. It's not just giving, but how do I receive, how do I re-establish that reserve that I have without depleting it? You have to have that. Any setting, you can choose your own setting, but you have to have a system where you recharge. I think one of the major problems that this Islamic work is lack of clear vision yeah. and mission and putting smart goals yeah, okay, that's yeah, absolutely. achievable. Yeah, absolutely. So defining those smart goals to be specific, time bound, achievable, yeah. uh, all of those six criteria, it is not clear and when people did not achieve the goal because those points are not clear for the reason. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, I could be said that, Dr. Makhir. You know, sometimes we do activities for the sake of activities. We think that I'm just doing activities, this is good. Many people attend it, you know. But we have to have a goal, a map. That's why it is good to have a planning thing, you know, something that we plan. What do I plan to achieve in the coming few years? I have to have a goal. And making that goal known to the people that are working with you. If you are in the leadership, you want to make sure that people that are working with you, they know actually what they're trying to achieve. You know, we have that thing, we're sharing that goal. This is what we're planning to achieve for the coming few years, you know. And this will give the person the motivation, even when they're not given clear instructions as to what they're supposed to do, they know what they're planning on achieving. So you can leave it to them and sometimes independently, and then they will be very efficient. But it has to be clear. It has to be clear. What am I doing this for? What is my goal? What is my purpose? What am I bringing in that others actually don't? I mean, I don't want to just duplicate what others are doing. Somebody's already actually filling, filling in that niche in there. Why do I have to do the same thing? Yes? I think also one of the reasons is if you're doing too many activities at once, you kind of like, because you feel like you can't do everything at the same time, and then you just... Yes. Well, you have to prioritize. You know, nobody can do everything at the same time. And sometimes you, you find yourself going, yeah, but this is important, and that is important, and that seminar is important, and that could, and it would be all over the map. You know, you cannot do that. You cannot do that. That's very inefficient. Sometimes you have to prioritize. Something got to give. You can't do everything. Nobody can do everything. You have to prioritize. And sometimes something that may seem important may have to be forsaken for the more important. There has to be a prioritizing. Well, when you go back to that same point, uh, when you think about al aqrabuna awla bil ma'roof, so sometimes you're staying late or you're going out and you're doing some Islamic work, but you're leaving your family staying at home. So which, I mean, how would you prioritize well, that? Well, as you could be haq fin as as Abu Dhar al Hadith al Mawkuf said that uh, that each person, I'm sorry, Salman al Faris, he said that each person or each side has to re to receive its it's due rights. That's why, yeah, without going to one extreme or the other, that you have to take care of your family because that's what you'll be questioned about first. I mean, your own family, your own children. But it doesn't mean that if I just take care of my family needs, it doesn't leave me time to do anything else. I think with a little bit of time management, I can achieve both. I can achieve a balance of both. And it is good to feel the responsibility, again, to the larger community. Not just to my own children, but I have to start with my children. I cannot neglect my children and say that, you know, everything will work, will work. No, it doesn't. Because that's one of the problems that happens to the du'a sometimes, the Muslim workers. You'll find the mashallah doing so many, uh, so much good work, but their own children basically are not what they're supposed to do, due to neglect or whatnot. Especially if the husband and the wife are involved with this time. I think that has to be balanced. The need has to be taken. But again, I think we can do a lot more than we realize. With a little bit of time management and prioritizing, we can do so much.
We can simply so much. So it's not either or. We can do both. change happens, whether you graduate, whether you find a job, whether you get married, you know, that I think a person has to realize, you know, it would be easier, again, if you have an aqib or somebody who's leading a certain halaqa that you're in, to point that to your attention. I think eventually, reality will impose itself, and you may learn these things the hard way, that I cannot do things every way. And sometimes, when you don't balance it, you go from one extreme to the other, and burnout will be the inevitable uh, result. I think what I said earlier, the hadith, Salman uh, al-Farisi, you know, that your soul has right upon you, your family has right upon you, your body has right upon you, give each their due rights. I think the brothers and sisters have to realize is that once you get married, now there's somebody, there's an additional person in your life. And that additional person is the most important person for you. So you cannot maintain things the way they were before. But at the same time, not to go to the other extreme, into basically giving that person everything and leaving all the other obligations out. I think balance is the key to that. Uh, how do you realize that? I don't know. Uh, how do you realize that? Anybody has any, any uh, input in that regard? I think thinking about that's the first step, definitely. That's, sometimes just that is sufficient enough to know that you can do everything. Anybody has any insight there? Yes? I was going to say, I think it all comes down to intention your willingness to want to uh, to merge with you. Like when you're married, it's like when you're married. So you have the option of spending time with your spouse or doing Islamic work. Or you have a third option of actually having, like, I mean, from the beginning of choosing a spouse that is also involved in Islamic work. So, so when you do an activity, you're also spending time together where it's not always, oh, once one person is out, another person is at home, and so they're not spending time together. And also, the, I mean, like you said, time management. Sometimes it's not one or the other. You can try to integrate both of them together. But it is good to set some time off for the family. Let's say you call it family afternoon or family day, where you don't even take calls actually on that day. It's something that's only for the family. It's good to set time actually for that. It's really important to have, to set some. But subhanAllah, I think a little bit of time management, which unfortunately sometimes is a little difficult, because now the distractions are so many. I mean, the, uh, especially with the social uh, network, you know, uh, Facebook, and everything that may not be important actually is catching your attention. You have to see every video, you have to see every uh, post, you have to... All of that basically eats much of your time. And may not be needed. That's why it's a good one of the uh, exercises that we did in uh, one of our halakas is to stay away from Facebook for about two weeks. Don't even look at the notifications. So close everything, basically and make sure that you don't receive notifications for two weeks away from that. And you'll be amazed how much time you have. It, it takes a lot of your time, actually. Now our interaction is, is, is centered, you know, in a good part, actually, on these uh, social networks. without coming 
stop it, like you're grabbing. So for example, um, like so for example, if you're if you're wanting to donate money to a charity that everybody knows is specifically the current financial hardship, so you're openly saying, oh well, you know, let's try to you know make a monthly donation and have this be a habit, but you don't want other people to say, you know, oh well, they're just showing off because they can make a monthly donation. Well, I mean, I think what people say, by the way, is of secondary importance in there. I think, I think um, what's going on, on in your heart, you know, between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most important thing. And I think you can ask yourself that if people weren't around, you know, or if that goal of teaching others wasn't there, would I still do it or not? I think it's good to ask yourself that. But there are certain acts that involve action more than intention, so to speak. That involve actually certain, it'd be nice to do it secretly. But Allah mentioned in the Quran that they do things openly and secretly. So sometimes, sometimes there's benefit in doing it openly, is that it encourages others. But you have to be careful not to take that too far to the extreme, to the point of becoming self-righteous, so to speak. You know, holier than thou. That, you know, I'm the one that's always in the position of teaching, and everybody's looking at me, so I have to do everything to teach others. You know, you have to be able to observe yourself and observe your heart, and if you find that this is happening, you may have to step back and sometimes uh, do less of it. Even if it means benefiting the other, sometimes if you fi find that's affecting my heart too much, you no, know, I will do it secretly. Still do it secretly. And sometimes there's a way around that. Like for example, when spending. I mean, it doesn't have to say, you know, this was donated by has a muscle being, you know. No, you can say, well, I a brother in the community. Just mention a brother, don't mention money. So this will be achieving both. But sometimes the only, even the acts of worship of Qiyam and this is good as well, this is really good. Sometimes it encourages because we feel alone we won't do it. Yes? So you basically acknowledge that you've reached burnout, right? And for whatever reason or the other, like you mentioned, um, but what if the solutions of praying, reading the Quran, you attempt to that and you just can't for some, whatever reason, get out of that burnout? But you still have the commitment to the community, you still have the responsibilities. What do you do at that point? You continue the commitment. I'll continue to fulfill that because I have an obligation in there, you know, uh, to do whatever actually I could. And maybe I would say don't expect too much of yourself in certain times. And then it passes. That sometimes may pass. I mean, so long as a person, of course, is doing the obligations. They follow up. So that's the one thing that you don't want to leave, of course, because these are obligations for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I can keep that, and I don't expect myself to go back to full steam right away. I would do whatever I'm comfortable with at the time. And here it is good, by the way, to diversify your acts of worship. You know, the Prophet ﷺ prays so many acts that each time you feel that this is the most important thing. The Quran, خَيْرُكُمْ تَعَدَمُ Quran wa This is the best thing. The best thing is to be kind to your parents. You know, I hear different ahadith. Well, which one is the best one? Whichever one you find your heart in, that's the best one. And sometimes, you can you can pick and choose. Again, so long as I did the obligations, Yes. I can do whatever I feel, I feel my heart in, whether yes. it means listening to a lecture, whether it means, you know, uh, helping my parents, helping my friend, whether reading Quran, reading Dikr, reading a good book, you know, uh, even uh, going on a trip, it's good. You know, and sometimes it is good to sit alone and then uh, re-evaluate. <coughs> it's good to have that even on a regular basis. And the Prophet established that, you know, the, uh, uh, the Atikaf Sunnah, you know, and he used to sit actually in the mess of the cave by himself to think and ponder on his thoughts to them. So it is good sometimes to isolate yourself, maybe taking a trip alone. And you don't have to go, off, go far, you know, sometimes even to a place close by, and then reevaluate and then rethink some of the things that I did in order to reestablish that balance. But sometimes <coughs> you can go through certain stages that maybe you shouldn't expect much of yourself until it passes. I'll just you know, hang on there until it passes. Uh, inshallah, I'll go back. So long as I know that eventually I'll go back to it. But at times, just leave it there for whatever it is. <laughs>